Jesus, we just thank you. Uh, thank you that you want us to draw near, and we want you to draw near. Help us to just make that active choice, Lord, to say, God, I need you. I depend on you. Every breath that I have is because you give it to me, because you have a purpose for what's to come. Lord, even in these times where we don't know what's next, give us hope. Give us that joy, knowing that the light will come, that even after every sun set, there will be a sunrise. After every season of cold, there is a season of warmth and growth. And in this, Jesus, we just we thank you for the joy that comes in knowing that although we don't know what's going to look like, we know you, and you've created us for this purpose, for this joy, for this connection within the body of believers. So Lord, help us to embrace that, to embrace the opportunity to connect with others and allow them to connect with us this beautiful web, God, that you're creating, this beautiful weave of a beautiful tapestry. Help us to be just a solid, confident part of that, Lord. As you weave us in, you are with us. Thank you, Lord, for that. Prepare our hearts today and prepare Donnie as well. Help us to hear your voice in all of this. Help him to speak your words. And may they sink in, not just today, but Lord, but as, as we walk from here, as we walk with you throughout our week, Make it a brand new day and a brand new moment, moment by moment, Lord, breath by breath. We are yours, and that is the most beautiful thing to be. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. I know that they are prepared for an awesome kids lesson today because I saw them having a meeting before church today with lots of teachers. So if you are a child today, you get to go back and enjoy what they have prepared for you. So all the kids, make your way back. You know, the day starts off pretty well when you drive into the church parking lot. And the first thing you see is the grass cut. And you're like, wow, that looks really good. And then you walk in the doors and you smell coffee that Diane made on the counter. Okay, those are two good things. And then you keep going and lo and behold, on the counter are chocolate covered strawberries to eat. My morning's doing pretty good already. Just those three things. And then I see children's teachers and leaders gathering for a meeting in the back room, which is something I haven't seen since we've been here. That's pretty exciting. And then there's a little note on my desk thanking the church for some flowers that we sent to this family and how appreciative they were. So before I ever get into this place and listen to, listen to the worship team practicing, I'm already pretty encouraged by, by what's going on. So... Today is a great day, it is the Lord's Day, and it is Memorial Day, all at the same time. If you are a veteran, you have served in any branch of the military, I would like for you to please stand up right where you are. We would love to applaud you today. Hold on. Don't sit down. Don't sit down yet. Start over here with Tom. Tom, tell us what branch and what you did and how long. Thank you. Torpedo assistant. Wow. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Um. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Donnie Crandall, I'm a, a, the wing chaplain in the Air National Guard, and I have been serving now for 16 years as a chaplain. I have a story for you today, Tom, as an Air Force pilot that I think you're going to enjoy. All of you should have an outline with you. Today's message is entitled, Jesus is my Jonathan. And we're continuing on with our study of David, verse by verse. We started in chapter 16, and now we've made it all the way to chapter 19. It's taken three months, but we have made it almost three chapters. Which, if you do the math, it's going to take us a while to get through the life of David. 
All of the lessons from his life are out there in the master copy of Life Lessons from King David. My hope is that you would have one of those little binders, collect those, and then you would have those for your own personal reference, something you could use in your own life or use as a tool to help somebody else along the way. Last week, if you remember, we talked about how there is no weapon formed against you that will prosper. And how King Saul was trying to creatively form these snares and traps and weapons against David. Do you remember what Saul did last week in the story? Let's start with the physical weapon. Do you remember what happened? Sword. And he tried how many times to pin David to the wall? Last week it was only two though. Last week it was two. And there's going to be more to come. And then he was not successful at pinning David to the wall, so he had to go to plan B to try and conspire against David. Do you remember what that plan was? Take my daughter. Yes, and when you take my daughter, of course you'll need to pay the dowry. And because it's the king's daughter, the dowry goes up, and the dowry will be 100 Philistines that you will need to kill. And when you go out and kill those Philistines... You won't come back because you have to kill a hundred of them. There's a lot more of them than there are you. So David, you will likely die in battle. That was his second snare or attempt. All these conspiracies, manipulations to try and kill David, even after Saul unsuccessfully tried himself. And why would King Saul be so dead set and intentional about killing David? As we go through the story today, Bonnie. Yeah, and that doesn't help any man's ego when all the women are praising this young whippersnapper called David more than they are King Saul. And that really bothered King Saul. I, I think if you were to do a case study in anger and jealousy and use King Saul as your, as your study case, you could do quite a study in the Bible on jealousy and anger and fear and how it works and how it acts out and how it isn't satisfied until it, it completely acts out and does the damage that it sets out to do. It reminded me this week of the, the whole idea of when the Bible says, do not have a root of bitterness. I started thinking about that. Why would you not want to have a root of bitterness? Yeah, because likely if you have the root Unless you do something about digging out the root, it's going to grow up and eventually it's going to have its way and it's going to hurt someone. So the same way with jealousy and anger, but that's not what the message is about today. That's just a little bit of preview as we get into the message today. Here's what's cool about today's passage. Not only does God provide a protection for David... And he doesn't let these conspiracies and these failed attempts of King Saul kill David. But God provides two interesting interventions on behalf of David's life. Today we're going to look at the first intervention. And what God provided as a way for David to escape the jealousy and the anger of King Saul. I'm entitling it, Jesus is my Jonathan. As you look at your outline or in your Bible, turn to chapter 19. Let's look at verses 1 through 7. 1 Samuel 19, 1 through 7. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. Now you know why J chose that scripture today so Jonathan told David saying my father seeks to kill you therefore please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide and I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are and I will speak with my father about you then what I observe I will tell you thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. 
For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, Goliath. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it, Dad, and rejoiced. That's not in there, Dad. I just had to put that in there. Dad, you saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, his son. And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David and Jon- then Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as in times past. Ladies and gentlemen, that is an intervention on behalf of another person that actually prevailed. It worked. Next week, we're going to look at another intervention by Michael, the wife of David, that saved his life. But today, his life is saved because of this relationship he had with King Saul's son by the name of Jonathan. This last week, I stood in the crematory at Walton's Funeral Home in Reno as the man, Brian Shull, laid draped with an American flag over his casket. And I stood with his wife as he was placed into the crematory and tried to offer comfort and support to this family. I was there with the director of the Nevada Military Support Alliance, the De La Torre family, which are huge builders in Reno. We're also part of this. She's the executive director for Nevada Military Support Alliance. And as we placed the body and I watched him go, it reminded me of this day, Memorial Day, and the, the life that this national hero lived, Brian Shull. Have you ever heard of him, Tom? Figured you had as an Air Force pilot. Just last weekend, he gave his final speech, not knowing that that night, after he stepped off the stage, he would collapse and have a heart attack, and that would be his final speech of his life. But in that speech, I want to give you a little glimpse of something he said that ties right into our story today. First of all, some fun facts. He flew the SR-71, the fastest jet that flies at 90,000 feet. It can fly over Nebraska in 4.3 minutes. Seconds. Minutes. Which they tell us is the best way to do Nebraska, is to fly over it quickly. (laughs) Steve Smith is not here today, so I knew that I could get by with that. However, if he hears that, he will let me know about that, I'm sure. (laughs) Brian was shot down, not in an SR-71, those, that plane has now been retired. There's some at Beale Air Force Base, the fastest jet that we have ever had. Only a few pilots have ever flown, and Brian Schull was one of them. But before that, in our combat in Vietnam, he was fired upon doing a mission over Cambodia, the jungles in Cambodia, and he was shot down. And on his way down, he said he grabbed tightly to the instruments and his face clenched and he thought okay this will all be over with soon just a matter of seconds and I'll be dead and I'll be in a better place and I'll be in heaven but it didn't work out that way his plane crashed but it didn't burn up it was on fire and when he came to himself in the jungles of Cambodia there he was he came to himself And he knew that he was on fire. He could see the fire. And he knew that his body was on fire. And he tells in his story, shoot, I ended up at the wrong place. Fire. He said he was just numb. His fingers couldn't feel anything. And his face is, is burned. But he said, I stand before you today not claiming to be a hero. Nothing special. Please, don't give me any accolades the people who are the hero in my story is the special forces that came to my rescue who couldn't get the airplane down because of combat fire and there wasn't enough rotary uh, distance 
for the propeller to come. So they hovered four feet above me. And they came down. And he said, while I was there, one of the men who had an, a, a gun, I forget what it was, it may have been an AR, I'm not sure, the, the helicopter couldn't get down to him. So the, one of our men that was there trying to save the life of Brian said to the person in the helicopter, you need to get that thing down here. And the helicopter said, I can't do it. There's not enough surface. And the guy said, you either come down here or I'm going to fire on you with this AR. And amazingly, the plane made it down further. And they were able to get his body up and take him to Kadena. And they said that he will likely die. We'll put him in a casket and we'll take him home. But the credit that he gives for his life, and he later then, they said he would never walk again. He actually had to retrain to get back into the Air Force, and they said, you can't do it. You don't have enough dexterity in your fingers. Not only did he have the dexterity in his fingers, he got the sixth highest test of any fighter pilot that's ever been tested, and he flew the SR-71 after that moment. And they said he would never fly again. Okay, in, this guy is a tough, tough guy, but he gives the credit to those who intervened on his behalf. And I'll tell you today, as we get into this passage a little bit, that David owes his success, he owes his life, he owes all the credit to a person named Jonathan who stood in the gap on his behalf. An intervention that Jonathan had for him, just like the intervention we're going to say next week. And I don't know, maybe you've been on the side of the intervention when somebody has stood up for you before and it's made a difference. And you have a debt of gratitude toward that person. Or maybe you have stood in the gap for somebody else. And you've been able to intervene to make a difference, possibly save someone's life or help a bad situation become a good situation or better. The first thing I want you to note about Jonathan today is that Jonathan delights in David. If we go back to chapter 18, verses 1 and 3, we begin to see how this starts out. The soul of Jonathan, who once again is the son of King Saul, who's given David all the trouble, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Think of that idea. Knit to the soul of David. There's a lot in that idea of, of being knit together in your soul. This is what we call brothers. This is what we call soulmates. This is what we call having your back for another person. And then in verse 3, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Imagine that. Jonathan, his soul was knit to David and he loved Jonathan loved David as he loved himself, as his own soul. Even though Jonathan had a father that despised and hated David, Jonathan had the kind of friendship that would be there for David. Now look at chapter 19, verse 1. This is where this word delight is introduced. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all the servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. There's that word. Jonathan not only had his soul knit with David, not only did he love David as himself, but Jonathan delighted in David. It's a beautiful word picture right there. What in the world does it mean to delight in someone? And if I was an ethicist, which I kind of am, but not really, not a professional ethicist, I would have a predicament here with my ethics regarding something that the king, who's my father, said to me versus another allegiance that I had in my soul. Jonathan had to struggle a little bit and say, okay, you know, you're supposed to obey your parents. That is a commandment. You know, children obey your parents. And here's his dad, King Saul, saying to Jonathan, Jonathan, you need to kill David. These were the instructions and it had to create a little bit of consternation in Jonathan, a little bit of ambiguity as to what is the right thing to do here. I've got my father, who's the king, who's telling me to kill David, and not only 
telling me, but he's telling all of the servants, you guys got to take David out, versus Jonathan's relationship with David, which was a soulmate relationship, which was a friendship. It was a brotherhood. It was powerful. It was two souls knit together. And it was a completely healthy relationship, by the way. And what's happening in our culture today, this is a side note, is this kind of friendship between these two men, which is God-ordained and God-given, at least in our culture, is perverted to be secularized and sensualized and sexualized and wrong. But they had a friendship of two men together that had a deep bond with each other. And it was beautiful because it was the kind of relationship that God wanted them to have. And it was powerful and it was deep. And it was the kind of relationship where you take a bullet for each other. It had loyalty. It had trust. It had all those things that relationships are built on. To the point that Jonathan delighted in David. What does it mean to delight in someone? Have you delighted in anybody lately? Has anybody delighted in you? They did when you were born, probably. They had a baby shower for you. You weren't really aware of it, but they delighted in you. And maybe in birthdays that you've had, you've had people kind of delight in you, and you sense that, wow, these people are celebrating me here. They're excited that I'm here. They, they love me. They are delighting in me. We used to have a ministry when I was in Visalia at the Visalia First Church of the Nazarene, and it was an informal ministry, but we called it the delighting in people ministry. So we'd show up at people's houses. We'd bring a cord of wood to one of our seniors that needed some wood to burn for heat. We'd show up at people's houses with gift cards and say, hey, here's 75 bucks to the Olive Garden. We'd show up and we would offer to take people out, kidnap them for the night, and just take them out. And we called it just delighting in people. This is a beautiful way to live. You know, I, I hope this week you can delight in somebody. You don't have to buy them a $75 gift card. Starbucks card will do, five bucks. Or wherever. Wait, what's the name of our coffee house? DS? D, DTS? DST. Okay, I was going to say, man, DTS, that's the program we use to do all of our auditing at the base. A DTS, Defense Travel System. All right, DST. Jonathan delighted in David. And the reason why I think Jesus or God is my Jonathan is because, and this is hard for me to grasp, full disclosure, to think that another person delights in you, that's good, and I like that. But to think that God delights in you. Look at this verse with me, Je Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. Get ready for this. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You ever read that verse before? Grant, is that a hard concept to believe that God is rejoicing and dancing over you? Yeah. When we're doing good and we are feeling very on top of our game, maybe it's easier to believe. If we haven't had a great week or our attitude was kind of poor or we responded to someone in a way that we shouldn't, oftentimes we don't feel worthy and we don't, we don't feel like we deserve to have anybody dancing over us or singing over us or rejoicing over us. But to think that God, who is with you, is not only mighty to save, but he takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That is an amazing thought, people. If you can believe that today about your life, there will be hardly any problem, there will be any problem that happens to you today that will be able to wipe the smile off your face if you can believe that. I contend it's not easy to believe. 
Even though all of us would fully accept, yeah, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believe that. But do you believe it for you? That's the key. God so loved the world that he gave his son for Tom. God so loved the world that he gave his son for Diane. See, that's a different story when you personalize it to yourself. To think that the eternal God, creator God who created you, actually rejoices over you. And the word can actually be translated dancing over you. Dancing over you. I can tell you this. When we celebrate Kaisen and we rejoice over him, that's our son, by the way. If you haven't seen him yet, you'll hear him. When we rejoice over him, it makes all the difference in the world as to how he acts when he feels that. In fact, did I ever tell you about what he does when Talisa and I hug each other? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Talisa and I will be in the kitchen, living room, and it'll be one of those moments where we just have to hug each other. We need more of those. But when those moments happen, we'll give each other a hug, and Kyson can't stand it. He cannot stand it. He has to get in the middle of that hook. So he comes up and he, he squirms his way in and he kind of pushes us apart a little bit. And now he's not mad that we're hugging each other. He's not mad at that. He just wants in on it. So this is what he says. Dad, you pull my arms. Mom, you pull my legs. So I grab his arms. Mom pulls his legs. And then he says, okay, go. Now do you know what he wants us to do? He wants us to pull separate directions as if we're fighting over him. And so I say, okay, he's coming with me. Mom says, no, he's not. He's mine. No, he's not. He's mine. I'm the one paying the bills around here. I'm the one who gave birth to him. You don't tell me. About... No, I, I want him. No, I want him more. And he laughs hysterically. He can't get enough of it. And when we sit him down, he thinks it's the greatest thing in the world that we would rejoice over him, that we would dance over him that we would be celebrating his life and to think that God gave this person Jonathan King Saul's son the desire to delight in David is an amazing thought because that's what contributed to Jonathan being the intercessor the one that intervened the one that became the wedge that saved David's Life, But I also contend that just as Jonathan delighted in David, the Creator God delights in you, rejoices over you, dances over you, celebrates you. And that thought is almost too much for us to bear. But the more you embrace that, the more positive you will be, the more excited you will be about life, the more hope you will have and the more joy that will be in your life. I've, can, I've thought for years that if we could truly get a grasp, even a tiny grasp of the love of God in our lives, it would change everything. We would never be the same again. But I know few who actually lean into the love of God and know that love that surpasses knowledge. I hope in the days ahead, we can believe and trust in the God who rejoices over us. Secondly, Jonathan not only delights in David, which is a picture of God delighting in us, Jonathan intercedes for David. He intercedes. He advocates for him. He becomes the wedge. He becomes that tool, the instrument that God uses to literally persuade his father, King Saul, to not kill David. And this is powerful. In fact, I was convicted of this week. This week I was convicted of this in thinking to myself, how much do I just say good things about people? Oftentimes we'll say something good, but we give a little caveat. Yeah, but... Da -da 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 -da. You see in the life of Jonathan here that everything he says to Saul is positive. It's support. It's affirmative. It's, it's good. Look at it with me. Jonathan intercedes for David. So Jonathan told David saying, 
My father seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. What's happening here in this verse? What is Jonathan doing on behalf of David? Protecting, warning him. And again, surely Jonathan has to be struggling a little bit here because he knows his dad's desires and wishes, which he needs to respect. But yet here's an innocent man named David who has become his soul brother, who he, he has become knit to in his spirit, whom he delights in. So he is giving David a heads up. He's interceding for him by saying, hey, look, my dad's after you. David already knew that. We tend to know those things when somebody tries to throw a sword at us a couple times and pin us to the wall. And then David gives some instructions and says, listen, be in this area. I'm going to come out to this area. You be hiding over here. Don't let my dad see you. But I'm going to have a conversation with my dad. I want you to stay in the vicinity. And then as soon as that conversation is over, I'm going to give you the results of what we talked about. Continuing on in the next verse. Thus, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. And he said to his father, let not the king, dad, you, let not the king sin against his servant, David, against David, because he has not sinned against you and because his works have been very good toward you. And I like this part right here because Jonathan is reminded, reminding his father Saul, hey, David hasn't done anything wrong. You don't want to sin against David. In fact, what he has done by killing Goliath has helped all of Israel. And dad, it's helped you. So he's trying to state the obvious to his father. He's trying to remind his dad that David is not the rebellious usurper that is trying to overtake the throne here. David is innocent. There's no, there's no accusations, dad, you can even have against him. And here is Jonathan fighting for David to his own father. He continues on. Dad, remember, David took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine Goliath. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? And he's reminding King Saul, Dad, you're smarter than this. You're better than this. Don't do something so stupid. Don't do something so egregious as to take the life of the very warrior that just brought freedom to all of Israel. He hasn't done anything against you, Dad. Treat him with respect. Don't kill him. He's benefited you, Dad. And he's trying to talk sense to his own father. He's interceding by bringing up the strengths and the compliments of David, by bringing up the good things about him. And again, I was confronted this week with this idea. How much, when I talk about other people, not that I ever do, but if I were to ever talk about somebody, how much of what I say is good, positive, healthy, affirming of the person that I'm talking about? Am I advocating and interceding with positivity about the person I'm talking about? If not, there's a word for that. Anybody know what it is? Gossip, thank you, Shelby. And the opposite of that is when we are spreading life. We, when we are letting out of our mouths health and good medicine and advocating on behalf of somebody else. And that's what Jonathan is doing. He's talking common sense. He's speaking truth to power. You ever hear that word? King Saul is the power. And David is speaking truth to power, his own dad on behalf of David. And thank God that he did because his speech to his father was persuasive and it made a difference. It solved the problem. Look at it with me. So Saul, oh, I'm sorry. Back up, back up. 1 John 2, 1. This is the spiritual part of this. How could I almost forget the biggest point here? My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. So just as 
Jesus is my Jonathan when it comes to Jesus rejoicing over me. Jesus is my defense lawyer. He is my advocate. He is your advocate. He is the one pleading your case to the Father, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. You've got a very good attorney on your hands. You didn't even have to pay him. In fact, he paid his own blood so that he could be your defense attorney. And the Bible tells us that he always lives to intercede for those whom he loves. You have an advocate, an intercessor, an intervener. Even when you blow it and sin, he intervenes on your behalf at the right hand of the Father. According to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. I hope you don't sin, but if you do, and you probably will, we have an advocate, an intervener, an intercessor who pleads your case on your behalf. And because he intervenes on your behalf, he saves you from the condemnation and the punishment that you deserve, and he provides you with grace in its place. And he provides you with salvation in its place. And you could not have achieved that yourself. You and I are completely dependent on the advocacy of Christ. Amen? And if he doesn't intervene, you're not making it. If he doesn't step in and become the wedge and the bridge, we're not living eternally with the Father. You and I are completely 100% dependent on the advocacy of Christ. And Jonathan played that role in a very human term, to, in very human terms, to save the life of David. And he pleaded with his father. Don't kill David. He's innocent. He hasn't wronged you. He saved our nation. He took out Goliath. What are you thinking, Dad? And sometimes you need to be the advocate for someone else. If you are a parent, you're advocating for your children, are you not? If you're a teacher, you're advocating for your students. In many situations in life, we're handed the role of being the advocate, the intervener, the intercessor on behalf of another. And then sometimes we're handed the role where we're called to step back and see the deliverance of the Lord and trust that God will bring an advocate to intervene on our behalf. But in either case, Jesus stands as our intercessor and our advocate. Did it work? Did Jonathan's speech actually work? Did it prevent the father from taking out the cruel punishment he wanted to have on David? According to the passage, it looks like it did. Look at it with me. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan. He heeded it. He believed Jonathan. And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as in times past. Think of that. Broken relationship, now restored. A wall was up, the wall is teared down. Fragmented relationship, now brought together in unity. All because of the intervening advocacy of Jonathan on behalf of David. And that's the advocacy that we have with Christ. So this is a very human story, yet it has spiritual implications for each of us. And I hope today when you leave that you'll have a greater openness to the love of God that is wider, higher, deeper, longer than any love this world knows. A love that goes so far as to rejoicing over you dancing over you and that God delights in you and secondly that he is your advocate today and our job is to put our faith in him our job is to look unto him our job is to open our hearts to him amen thank you for all of you who have served today and as we kind of leave today, I hope that you will once again be reminded that you can have your barbecues because of some soldiers. 
and some airmen. We all gave some in the military, but some gave all. And Memorial Day is celebrating the idea that some gave all. And there's one in particular that gave all. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Gracious God, we love you today. We thank you that on this Memorial Day, we do think of all of the military personnel that have gone before us. We stand on their shoulders. All of those who will come after us, less than 1% of the American people ever sign up to be part of this protective force we call the United States military. Less than 1%. And we are eternally grateful for the sacrifice of those who have served, those who are serving, and those who will serve. But even that runs second place to the love and gratitude of a gracious God who gave all. Because to give your one and only son is to give all. And you gave him that we might have life. So that we could be forgiven. And you were an advocate on our behalf. And you stand today as our continual intercessor and advocate. And we remember. We remember those who have fallen. Those who have served. And most of all, we remember the one who has died for us so that you could rejoice over us. Help us to believe that and experience that and then maybe offer that to somebody else. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. Thanks for coming today, guys. You are dismissed.